Losers came to mind, but um, anyway, I won't mention that this morning. But they, I think they lost out by not being here. Do you think so? Maybe, yeah. I'm trying to p- pass the guilt along to make them feel really bad. You know, you've advertised I was coming. They weren't here, so. It hurts right here. Well, we live in North Carolina near Asheville where God lives, and uh, so we're... We're glad to be here. My wife Karen's over there. Say hi. She's... And I don't get that. Why does she get that? So we have five children. We adopted three. Help! And we we're thinking of maybe adopting um, one more, but we'll see. God's definitely got to be in that one. Um, but our son is eight, and his sisters are 10 and 11 now. And we've had him in our home about three or four years. So, um, and we're still, we're still here. <laughs> it's tough. Has anybody else adopted? Um, okay, great. All right. And um, it's a great thing. How many of you have been adopted? Yeah, we've all been adopted into the family, I hope, right? So, so that's true. And... Um, now, my wife brought out something I didn't think about this morning, uh, being your name is Goldsmith, so you're Jewish, right? I mean, that's a Jewish name. Is that right? You got some Jewish lineage? I didn't know Jewish people were that tall, though, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so. so, you know your lineage and stuff? Um, okay, well, we got, a talk, we got a talk later about our Jewish heritage, you know. So, <clears throat> my father was born in Russia in 1902. He was in, um, which now is Ukraine. Um, and he, his name was Levitansky, and they changed it to Levinson when they came over on the boat in the harbor of New York, and then um, to Levinson, and then he changed it uh, as a young man to Vinson later on, and then I, <clears throat> then he married my mom, so I was born a Vinson, and then when I was about 18 or 19, I changed it back when I heard the story to Levinson, because I liked the Jewishness of the name. Anybody else Jewish out there? Anybody else Jewish? Okay. Anybody Christian? You've been adopted, so now you're kosher. You know that, right? This is a slow body here, slow body, slow body. So now you know I'm I'm Jewish on my father's side, so i got to ask you a question. Um, How many of you know who invented copper wire? Who invented copper wire? Does anybody know? Do you know? Okay, it was two Jews fighting over a penny, so... Okay, anyway, let's move on. So, Hey, they, they get better than that. So, so um, our, our ministry is genesisseminars.org, and if you would like to like us, we would like that. Um, and I've been doing this for, uh, let's see, next Sunday, I'm starting my 12th year um, doing creation ministry. And I used to be a one-on-one in the school system, in the public school so that's why I do what I do, because I saw the need to teach the truth of creation and the live evolution. And um, Karen and I, um, God willing, if we're still here, and I hope we're not, <laughs> I hope we're on the other side of the Jordan, um, are going to our 50th state, which will be away in, in March uh, when, when Bruce pays our way. So we're looking forward to that. So... And I think about 11 or 12 countries now doing creation. So God is good, and he's taken me to a lot of places. Um, So um, I don't have a book table, but um, let's see. If you're taking notes and you want to just kind of get to know our ministry a little more, uh, it's been several years since I've I've been here because of your pastor's fault. But hopefully uh, next year, next year, (laughs) which is... Next week, um, next fall, I have some openings, so, um, and I, I have more to do, so uh, the fossils, Noah's Ark dinosaur message um, is something that r- will really equip you, because so, there's so much confusion about fossils, dinosaurs, and all that, and um, it, you've really got to hear that message, but let me just uh, introduce some of my uh, wife's family to you. Sure. I mean, sorry, my family. So she doesn't like that joke. So anyway, my, my side of the family. 
And uh, I normally travel alone, so that's why I say that. So, um, but you know, a lot of you didn't like that one, did you? A lot of people uh, laugh at that, and um, but you know, there are a lot of PhDs that believe that. There's a lot of really, 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 really smart people that believe we came from monkeys. Do you? Please pray for my grandmother. She's not going to do that. You know, let me tell you something. You guys are a blessing because a lot of church people don't know how to laugh. Isn't it sad? You know, it's sad. But y'all know how to have a good time. Isn't it wonderful that God created laughter? It's a good medicine, isn't it? Makes us feel good. Um, some of you right now are going through a hard time. And you might be hurt. You're not telling anybody. You're not really showing it in public, but inside you're hurting. And I pray God will heal you. And, um, and, and laughter is good. And I just pray a God's special blessing on you. Karen and I are going through some stuff right now um, in our family, and we covet your prayers. John chapter 18, verse 37. Um, why did Jesus come to the earth? Well, we just celebrated, didn't we? He just, we, we're celebrating Christmas, right? And he came um, as the King of Kings, didn't he? And the Lord of Lords in a stable. And why did he come? And the answer's right here. The answer's always in the Bible, isn't it? Isn't it? So John chapter 18, verse 37, Jesus is standing in front of Pilate, and it's right before the crucifixion. And Pilate said unto him, Are you a king? And we, we're celebrating the king of kings that just came. Jesus answered, You say I'm a king. To this end was I born. Um, and uh, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the what? Truth. That's the key word today, truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And then Pilate asks him an amazing question. He says, what is truth? Now, who is Pilate? I reckon Pilate to the world. Okay, so Pilate is the world, and the world's staring at Jesus uh, in the face. So the world is watching you, aren't they? And they're watching us when you go through a drive through and you have a bad attitude because your food wasn't on time. That's me. Is that you? How often do we complain that it's not on time, it's too hot, too cold, or not too hot, not too cold? And aren't we a spoiled America people? We are. We're bad. I'm bad. And I continually work on that. And I tell you who helps me work on that is my 17-year-old daughter that keeps me in check. Daddy? <laughs> you know? And I have to say, oh, yeah. So isn't it nice when our children keep us in check, moms and dads? But... You know, we've got to be careful. Because um, then I can't hand out a track when I have a bad mouth, right? And so God, aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit that says, mm, you did it again, <laughs> right? I'm glad he's still in the working business of conviction, aren't you? But what is truth? Uh, the world is watching us, like Pilate was looking at Jesus and said, what is truth? And Jesus had been preaching for years. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the world watches us. And of course, raise your hand if you're a perfect Christian. You know, you know, no, we're not perfect, but we're supposed to be working towards that every moment of the day. And isn't it difficult? It's hard to do, isn't it? I'm going to talk about this little thing right here, right? That gets us in trouble in just a minute. But what is truth? Well, how many of you grew up in public school like I did? Anybody grew up? Wow, okay. So a lot of us grew up in public school, and I did in Tampa, Florida, where I grew up. And it was tough for me. Um, I was a lonely kid, didn't really have any Christian peers that really took me under their wing and discipled me. Anybody with me there? Um, did anybody kind of grow up in school without any Christian buddy? I did. And it was tough. So I want to encourage the young people here today. When your classmates looking, are looking at you, are they saying, are you a true Christian or are you one of those fake Christians? In Sunday school, <clears throat> if you were here, we talked about two kinds of sciences. And there was how many? 
two kinds of sciences, a fake science and a real science, and we get the fake science where? Museums, textbooks, movies, television, on and on and on and on and on. We get that fake science. And there's a lot of fakeness in church today, and I want to encourage the young people, be a true Christian, so that when your peers are watching you, and they are, they want to know, you know, are you, are you real? So that you can share your faith. So that they don't say, man, you're a hypocrite because you got a dirty mouth and you, don't, you go to you know, Laurel Hill and you're, well, Jesus, do you worship, you know? And so I want to encourage the young people here today. Don't just get a great education, by the way. Um, no one ever shared, as far as I can remember ever, no one shared the gospel with me. Twelve years of public school. I don't think anyone ever invited me to their church. Man, you have opportunities every day to do that. With, you, with your classmates, to invite them to a great church, right, Pastor? Amen? Amen? A great, great church with a great pastor who believes this book right here. And so you have great opportunities. But look, you know, you're going to go through 12 years of school, maybe another four years of college or whatever. The best thing you can do is, is share the gospel and be a true Christian so they won't have a doubt in their mind that you're sold out for the Lord. Isn't that a good idea? I do thank God for my coach in middle school who said, Steve, <clears throat> he was a Christian, and I could tell. And um, public school coach said, Billy Graham's coming to town. Who's that? 1979, and that's where Jesus found me and my brother and sister too. So I just think, I, I'm looking forward to meeting my coach in heaven one day. So what is truth? It's in your hand, isn't it? Show me the truth. Did you bring the truth today? Okay, good. Um, last week I had the truth in my hand via my phone and I pushed the wrong button and my, my phone friend started preaching the Bible and I, had, I was quite embarrassed. So. But anyway, it's good to have a paper copy too. But we have the truth in our hand and, and, and I described it earlier as a lot of you did too. I said describe the Bible in one word and you did a good job and my favorite word is history, right? It's a history book, isn't it? Now, some of you have been around the world. I've already talked to some of you, and you've been to different countries, and um, I've been blessed to go to many countries. <clears throat> and I've been to Israel three or four times. Never, ever thought I'd go once, and God is good. He's blessed me to go to Israel. And this past January, I was in Israel again, and um, for two weeks, I was a caveman, and it was fun. So are cavemen real? Here I am, okay? So cavemen are real. Ape men, that's Hollywood, isn't it? Keep that in mind. So for two weeks, I'm in this cave. Okay, I didn't spend the night, but anyway, I'm in a cave for two weeks, passing bucket after bucket after bucket after bucket of dirt and rock and sand and dust, and it was fun. It was. And one day I was outside of my cave stretching, and I looked down below, and I was looking at the Dead Sea. And across the Dead Sea, you're looking east, is the country of Jordan and the beautiful mountains of Jordan, who's, who's not happy with Israel right now. Another thing that we see in the world, because uh, and what the Bible uh, says as well, what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. I said that earlier. So what are we seeing? We're seeing countries around Israel, not like in Israel. Isn't that what it says here? In the end times. But anyway, I'm looking at the Dead Sea, and just down below to my left is where a little shepherd boy threw a rock, and he found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'm at this place called Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So that's what we were looking for. We were looking for some scrolls, and it was a, a monumental uh, opportunity, to say the least. And I got in at God's time, let me tell you. So... What were we looking for? What were we doing? It's all about that word up there called history. Okay? History. You can go to Israel any day and find somewhere to go digging. There's digs all over Israel. What are they digging for? What are they finding? Um, next, God will, in May, hopefully, I'll be in Israel again, north of Jerusalem, in a place called Shiloh or Shiloh, however you want to pronounce it. And there's a big dig going on. And what are they finding? Hundreds of thousands of pieces of pottery. Uh, coins with somebody's face on it that 
we find in the Bible? What's that called, archaeology? That's that real science, you see? So we see archaeology continuing to confirm, to agree with the Bible. This past January, I was also at a place, uh, this big this hill, and there were these ruins that they just discovered like 12 years ago. Or no, about 15 years ago, recently. And there happened to be this archaeologist that was part of this excavation, and his wife were having tea. And my brother and his wife and I were there together. And uh, they, this couple said, have tea with us. So we're like, okay. So we're having tea, and he's talking to us, and he says, look down there across the valley, and you see that area down there? That's where the Philistines were. And this is the valley where David and Goliath fought, and you're standing where Paul set up his encampment. It's in the Bible. And so you go to Israel any given day and you can find the history. How do we know the Bible's true? Because preacher Bruce says it's true. No. Young people, how do you know the Bible's true? Because mom and daddy says it's true. No. Go to Israel and you can discover it's true. Amen? And um, I'm not even talking about the hundreds of prophecies that have come true about Jesus. Every one of them. And so how do we know the Bible's true? There's a lot of ways, not just because preacher and mom and daddy says it's true. Very important. So that's archaeology. How about biology? You know, the sciences agree with the Bible. So biology, right? Um, what's DNA? What part of science is, does that have to do with? Right, genetics, right? Okay. And so what's DNA? What is DNA? Who can pronounce that big word? Di Go ahead. Very good. Okay, awesome. I can't do it. That's why I say DNA. So you're looking through a microscope because that's how you can see DNA. By the way, mankind's messing with DNA. And I don't think God likes it. But, but you can look through a microscope and look at DNA. It's that very, 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 very complex stuff we're made of, you know. And what are you looking at? You're looking at God's fingerprints. Are y'all an amen church or not? Can you say amen? Okay. Who would say there's no God, a fool? In the wintertime, when it's not raining, you can look up at night. You don't even need a telescope around here. You can see the heavens are screaming the glory of God. There's some science right there. How about the second law of thermodynamics? Can you do that one? What's the second law of thermodynamics? How many looked in the mirror this morning? Two people, okay. Three, four. Whew, okay, so. <clears throat> Can you edit this part? Because my daughter, my daughter loves the thing called a mirror. Hours. Hours. Always late. You know it, if you're watching. So you look in the mirror, and what are you looking at? Science. The real science. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. We're looking at something that's going uphill, right? We are losing information. <laughs> We're losing information, aren't we, brother? I see some of my brothers in there. We're losers. We're losing our... We're losing our... We're losing our... I got a button called panic. And that's how I find my truck, do you? Who's with me on that? Come on, come over. Where are you at? I see those hands. Okay. So, look. There's a fake science, a real science. The fake science doesn't agree with the Bible. The real science does. The second law of thermodynamics says things are going downhill. But evolution says things are going uphill. You know, adding new information to, genetic, to, to the genetic pool and all that. Mm -mm. It goes against science. So just remember, when you look in front of the mirror, just remember the Bible's true. The Bible says the world is waxing worse and worse and worse. We've got so much cancer. All we ever hear about is cancer now. And so much stuff. Things are getting so bad. All right, uh, let's move on. So, is the Bible relevant? Is Genesis relevant? 
You know, it just seems like there's an attitude today that the, that the Bible's outdated, it's irrelevant. But you know, what do we get from our Bible? God's Word. How many thinks the Bible's true? Raise your hand. Those of you that were here for Sunday school, you can educate the others. Okay. So creation is a great place to start. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning was, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and that's good enough for me. And your neighbors are going to hell. They don't want to hear about your Bible. They don't care about your Bible. They don't care about your church, your pastor. All we are is a bunch of lunatics to the world today. And so we've got to help people understand because all they will say is, I believe in science. I've heard it. I believe in science. Well, what kind of science are they believing in? A lot of that fake science. And they don't know the real science. And we, we've got to be educated, folks. We've got to care. So here's a great verse. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being." And there are many verses about creation in Psalms and everywhere. But we've got to get beyond the good enough for me and help people understand other things like science. Marriage, these, these are being compromised, by the way. Creation is being compromised behind pulpits and churches and cemeteries everywhere. I mean, seminaries everywhere. <laughs> so marriage is another doctrine that's being compromised. By the way, I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm not here to make you feel good, necessarily. I'm here to tell you the truth. Do you want it? Marriage is being compromised today. I've already mentioned it earlier in the previous message that, you know, your televisions, some people call it televisions and Hollywood, and it's exactly right. Because your televisions are are teaching you what the new norm is about marriage. And you're letting your children in front of that television. You see, Satan's not stupid. He's, he's Genesis 3.1, he's the most subtle creature. And he, he's all about subtleties and slipping things in very subtly where you don't really pay attention, but you do back here. So we have to be sober and vigilant. And unfortunately, the church is asleep. And I'm encouraging you to wake up because some people in churches today when they go to the polls and they vote a president or a governor or a senator or a mayor or a school board official what do they believe about marriage what's their ambitions to be president one day think about that well i know somebody that got marriage right and jesus said answered and said unto them haven't you read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And said, for this cause shall a manly father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Is that normal? That's an easy one. Your televisions are saying, ignore that. That's old fashioned. And then we wonder, what happened? What happened? I would venture to say most all of you parents out there are trying your best. But a lot of times, Satan's one inch above our best sometimes. That's why we can't let our guard down one millimeter. And folks, when you go to the polls, let me encourage you. Let me charge you whatever it takes to convince you. Stop voting the same way you voted because great-grandma voted that way. All this stuff doesn't matter about this party garbage. It's what's right and what's wrong based on this right and wrong, not your right and wrong. See, that's the problem. And so I want to encourage you, how can we describe this book in one word? How about instructions? Before you go to the polls, read it. What does it say about marriage? What does it say about pro-life? Amen? Sin is another doctrine today that's being compromised, undermined. I said earlier, you know, I talked about this little a little item in our mouth called a tongue that the Bible talks about, and it says that's what gets us in trouble the most. It's what comes out of your face that gets you in trouble. My wife's here. She'll testify there. Big problem with this little thing. It's like, it just keeps running. It's like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. It's like uncontrollable. And... 
I got to, you know, practice Christianity when I'm on the road, you know, man, get behind the wheel. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. <laughs> right? Anybody with me on that? It's tough. It's tough. You get problems introduced into your family and frustrations and anger. It's like. Pfft. And then we have a God that renews his mercies every morning. Aren't you glad that we are not consumed? I've said that verse so many times this past year. But it's true. We wake up in the morning and thank God. I'm alive. He didn't kill me in the night. He didn't consume me like a vapor like that song said we were. Isn't he nice? Isn't he gracious? Sin leads to what? Where's my buddy? Where's my 1010 buddy? Where's he at? Okay. We're all sinners. We're all going to die. And what happened at 911? 3,000 people died. Okay? Um, I think I picked up a prayer request this morning about a little baby that died. Death happens to all of us. We're all going to die somehow, some way. Maybe a, a calm way, maybe a tragic way, we're all going to die. 911 was tragic. And where did people go after 911? Every Sunday I hear church. Churches were full. What's going on? 911. What's happening here? Is there a God? What, why is he letting this happen? It, it, some God of love, he is. Why did he let 911 happen? Why did he let this precious little three year old sweet girl die in such a tragic way? And you're at a funeral, and people are at a funeral. Best places for evangelism. And people are wondering is there a God? Why would he let this happen? And I've met some people that call themselves atheists. And there might be somebody here today in disguise, but as a Christian or whatever you are, um, and, but inside you're a self-proclaimed atheist. And I've bet some. Well, Romans 1 has the answer to what atheism is about. Romans chapter 1. I'm telling you, read that chapter tonight, today. But it talks about sodomy and it talks about atheism. And it's amazing what we're seeing today that agrees with Romans 1. Again, 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 again. So what does Romans 1 say about atheism? There's no such thing. Huh? There's, I mean, you're lying to yourself because it says here you're suppressing the truth. The truth of what? That there's a God who loves you and has created a leaf insect. I'm telling you, go on YouTube and or just look at a picture of a leaf insect. It's so marvelous. What do we see? Purpose, design, order, complexity that point to a loving God. And the millions of things that we see in creation, because God says in Romans 1, they're going to be without excuse in that day because I have shown it unto them. What is God showing you? Every time you go outside in your garden, in the woods, somewhere, you're seeing creation. And so you have to suppress the truth. You see a creator up here through this part of your head, but you're putting God way back here saying there is no God because you want to live your own way, a lot of people. That's what a lot of people think. They, there's no God, and I want to live my own way, and you know, <clears throat> so you have to suppress the truth. But look, take people back to the history book and say, you know what, 911 was terrible, but let me tell you, we're all going to die. And it goes back to this one guy named Adam, and everything was perfect, God created everything good, and this guy, Adam, he messed it up for everybody, and we're all sinners. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah, okay. And so that's why we're going to die, because we're all sinners. Well, that's the bad news, man. I want some good news. Well, we got it. It's in your hand. It's called the gospel. Why, aren't, why is it that only 5% of the church is sharing the gospel? I happen to pass out tracts in my travels, you know. How easy is that? I'm pass it. Here's something good. For, would you read something good? here? Sure. Got a commitment right there. And I, I'm pretty confident I'm going to see at least one person in heaven come to me and say, you remember that day at McDonald's? <laughs> you gave me a track. Yeah, McDonald's. We're in heaven, man. Don't talk about McDonald's. You, you passed out a track to me. I'm so glad. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There's the gospel right there. It's just the victory in Jesus. You ever sing that song? Right? Sure. When Jesus gets the victory over Satan, the promise to Adam and Eve of a Savior and clothing is certainly compromised today. I've been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches that modesty is a problem and it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. 
But clothing is important. It shows Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Is God providing for you? So here he provided the covering for Adam and Eve and not Adam and... Thank you. And we see the lamb in the background. The Bible doesn't say it was a lamb there. It was an animal. And of course, it points to the, the sacrifice of the one to come. So we have these four shadows, but Jehovah Jireh. So these are foundational doctrines. There are others. But if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations, right? So how many has ever built a house before? Maybe you built a house. I mean, you did the work. You didn't ask for the key. Is that you? You asked for the key or did you do the work? Did you do the work? Okay. So you built a house. So you started with the roof. You started with a foundation. And you got it right, right? Okay, because it's important. Foundation. Okay, Christian school, foundation. Church, foundation. Christian home, foundation. Oh. Yep, those are all good things. My children are safe. Hmm. Do they live in the world? <laughs> so I took a class three years ago. And the sheriff was given the class. I wasn't in trouble. So I wanted to start carrying, you know what I mean? I know some of you are. Am I safe here? I'm safe here, aren't I? Okay, okay. And so some of you are probably packing your grandmas, I'm sure. <laughs> They're the ones that pack the most, okay. And so I took this class. It was eight hours of law. It was pretty tough for me, okay? I'm a slow learner. So eight hours of law so I could start carrying responsibly, safely, and all that. And somebody in the class asked the sheriff a question. I don't remember what the question was, but the sheriff's answer was, this is all about eight hours of law, and the sheriff's answer was, if you just read it as written and you don't add anything or subtract anything, you'll be okay. And I thought, bing! Don't add to this book. Don't subtract from this book. If you just read it like it's written, plain and simple, it'll be all right. We'll understand it. You see, Genesis is your foundational book, isn't it? If you say Adam wasn't a real person, like a lot of secular college Bible professors say, and then our children go through state colleges and take Bible classes with people that have compromised God's word, then they come out a changed person, don't they? So we have a foundation, and we have a continuous story, don't we? Because if you say Adam wasn't a real person, then this is a wonderful, exciting club at best. How many of you believe Adam and Eve were real people? So what's going to happen if you don't have a solid foundation and an earthquake comes along? Young people, you go to college, you're going to have a, an earthquake experience or two. Because your professors that are professing themselves to be what? wise Romans 1 are fools and they have but they're professors and they've got so many degrees their, their wall is covered with them they have a temperature every day so many degrees you know and look at their classroom you'll get that later and look at their classroom it's got so much scientific stuff in it and it's, they're so smart what does mom and dad know <sighs> and you don't have a solid foundation of the real and fake science. And what are you getting in classrooms? A lot of it's fake science. You're going to have a crisis of faith. It happens all the time. So here's the problem. We see two worldviews. We see two castles here. The one on the left, the foundation is there's no God. That's what evolution teaches. And what comes out of this humanistic teaching, the problems we're dealing with today? People making up their own rules in courts and on television and whatever about abortion, pornography, racism, homosexual behavior, and all this stuff. That's what we're dealing with. And then meanwhile, the church is asleep. Like this person right here and two of you I've been watching for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> and we're asleep. We're not paying attention. We don't care. We're apathetic and ignorant. And we're under attack, under attack, under attack. Meanwhile, the church is asleep. But aren't you awake when the game's playing? Aren't you shouting? I'm not here to tickle ears. I'm here to encourage. That's encouragement. You can call it what you want, but it's fact. 
And here people are doing what? Here's a couple church people shooting themselves in the back, you know, gossiping and all this stuff. Fighting over dumb stuff. Here's a person that's a church attender. Forsake not, I forsook not the assembling of myself today. I can check mark that box once more. And you're not involved in a wonderful ministry inside and outside of these walls. Let me encourage you to be involved. That means get out of your box. Call fear and excuses. Fear and excuses. Fear and excuses. Get out of your box. And here's a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, somebody in authority uh, in the church, and they're compromising their own foundation within the church. They're reinterpreting God's word. Was there really a worldwide flood? You can answer that one. How do you know? And our brains as Christians, and that, I'm not being critical here, but we automatically go back to the Bible. Because we are programmed to say, the Bible says so. And I hear it every Sunday. And you know what? It's good and bad because we need to understand the Bible's true, right? And, and we believe that, amen? And that does settle it for you, but not the world. Because the world is begging for answers, how we know there was a worldwide flood. Have you ever been in an aeroplane before? And have flown over the Grand Canyon like I have? And you see this big ditch? And I've flown over many parts of the East, right? Middle East, the Alps, and America, and all over the place. And you know what I see? No evidence for a worldwide flood. No. <laughs> I see lots of it. It's not just the Grand Canyon. They don't want you to think about any place else in the world when you're at the Grand Canyon. They want you to thinking about this, this little tiny river called the Colorado River that over six million years of time have carved out the Grand Canyon. And they don't want you to think about all the worldwide evidence of a, of a worldwide flood. It's everywhere. So we need to show people because they want to see it and give them the evidence of a worldwide flood. Because if you say the Bible says so, they're going to write you off as a nut. Am I right or wrong? That's the world we live in today. All right, for the time will come. Well, they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the what? Come on. And shall be turned unto fables. If I were to say to you, greater is the power that's in you than he that is in the world, that is a lie. And for those of you that aren't paying attention, I'll say it again. Greater is the power that's in you than he that is in the world is a lie. Why is it a lie? Do you know there are preachers today in big, 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 big churches. They look like football stadiums, you know. And there are thousands in attendance. And they love to hear that. I have power. <sighs> what did Satan do in Genesis 3.1? Or Genesis, yeah, 3.1. He's very subtle, and he says to Eve, you can have what? You can be like God. He said that to Jesus in the wilderness. And he says it to you and I. He says it to the ten people that own the world today. <laughs> you know? They're the richest people. And somebody wants to be top dog. And so guess what? He uses preachers to preach lies. That greater is the power. No, you don't have power. You are nothing. Did you know that? Doesn't that sound good? You are nothing. You are zeros. I am? Yeah, we are. But there's a verse in the Bible. Let me see. Philippians 4.13. Let's see. What is that? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You see, we are nothing apart from Christ. He is the vine, right? We are the branches, right? We, you can do nothing without me. You see, it's not greater is the power that's in us because we are powerless. David didn't come to Goliath swinging that rock and say, I'm going to win this battle. He gave it to God. And all of us are fighting battles. And if we try to fight him in our, on our own, which we think we can, we're going to lose. We've got to give him to God. And it certainly is hard because what does God know about my battle? <laughs> Everything. So it's greater is what? Are you awake this morning? He. You see, it's all about him, not us. He makes us have some power. Amen? It's all about him. Let's move on. 
Young people, please pay attention. Moms and dads, here we go. Of the children raised in your church, look around at your youth, your children right now. They're not safe. Don't ever think they're safe. Because we have an enemy that wants to eat them up. Don't ever be... We're supposed to be sober and vigilant every second of the day. It's so important. I'm telling you. We can do our best and... And do our best, and do our best, and then we get T-boned. You know what I'm talking about. You're going through an intersection, bam, right in the side, you get T-boned. Where did that come from? Of the children raised in evangelical homes, most will leave the church when they're 18 and say, see you later, God. No absolutes, evolution is true, the Bible's not true, millions of years and we came from monkeys. That's what our children are learning in school, on television. Evolution is true, the Bible's wrong, Monday through Friday in almost every subject. And then Sunday morning cartoons, they're safe. Boop. Nope, they're watching cartoons full of evolution. And then they come to school, oh, and they're so bored they hear another Bible story. And that's all they think it is. Same, no difference in Hansel and Gretel or Goldilocks and the Three Bears. That's how it can pre be presented to them, Sunday school teacher, if we're not careful. We've got to teach this stuff, the, the stories. It's not just a story, but history. Amen? It really happened. And you can go dig it up in Israel. And so, again, television, uh, History Channel, PBS, Discovery Channel, Monkey to Man Evolution, and then they sneak in a commercial selling insurance, too. And then this movie talking about dinosaurs and people living millions of years apart. Don't you pick on SpongeBob. You know why I'm picking on SpongeBob? Because he's picking on your children. It says, ah, oh, dawn breaks over the primordial sea. It's here that millions of years ago life began. Where are you at, Mom and Dad? Well, your children are plopped in front of the television, the programmer. That's why they call it programming, right? They're programming. And you're off doing the dishes or making supper or whatever. We all do that. Are you listening to what they're watching? Are you watching what they're watching? It's easy to just trust media. We all do it. But we have to be sober and vigilant. We have to be listening because it only takes one word in a whole movie which will sink in, and then when they're 18, drop by drop by drop by drop, what happened? And so this is, you know, then we become the missing link between that programmer and our child's spiritual future. I'm telling you, Satan's not happy. He knows his, it's not his days are number, numbered, his minutes are numbered. Don't you think? How many thinks Jesus is coming soon? Are you about his business or the world's business? And so where are these books at? Children's books on evolution for kids. Christian schools, public schools. Why are they in Christian schools? Because Christian school administrators, my wife and I know this firsthand of more than one or two Christian schools that have this in their Christian schools because they have book fairs earn some money for the school and what sneaks in book fairs of the lie and then Christian school administrators aren't paying attention or they don't care and Satan's happy about that how many of you like to go to zoos raise your hand how many of you grew up at a zoo okay I see the hands okay and so we're looking at a giraffe over here look Billy look at this giraffe over here God God made this giraffe well Billy's reading a sign and it says the earliest primate Mama, what's a primate? Mama, what you? Well, let me tell you, son, a primate, that's evolution. Oh, yeah, that's that fake science, isn't it, Mama? Right? They should know that because we're training them to read, oh, the difference between the real and fake science. So what's evolution doing to you and your families, your children? A lot. But here's three things. Materialism, relativism, and the devaluation of life. What's materialism? When you watch that thing called television, it's telling you there's no God, abortion's okay, sodomy's okay, whatever you want to do is okay. You make up your own rules because there's no God. Am I right or wrong? 
Uh, four years ago, three years ago, I was teaching um, some five-year-old boys basketball. Fun. It was fun. Uh, upwards basketball and great ministry. Five-year-old boys, and we have this five-minute devotion, and the key word was fear. So we said, boys, what are you afraid of? One boy right away says, zombies. Why? Why would you be afraid of? Duh. Mom and dad aren't thinking. I want to encourage you. You want revival in your church? Or do you want another set of meetings? You know how many churches just have meetings? And how many churches have a real revival? You want a real revival? It starts in your house first. Listen to me. Revival starts in your home first. Change the channel of some of the stuff that you're watching. Better yet, do what we did, throw your TV away. 20, almost 20 years ago we did. I'm still alive. What have we missed? I mean, you've missed what? A lot of wickedness, evil, garbage. You want revival? Make some changes. Do some radical stuff. It's a bondage. Think about that. But that television's telling you, this is okay, this is a new norm now. You see, evolution, it's the foundation of this stuff. And it says that this is the only reality. Your life, this is it. And when you're dead, there's no afterlife. So party on, party on, party on, just as in the days of Noah. Party on, party on, party on. Because when you're dead, that's it. So have fun. And this fosters relativism, no absolute moral truth. Poll your young people here. Most youth groups, most youth will say there's no absolute moral truth. 44% of born-again adults, 9% of born-again teenagers are certain of absolute moral truth. Is this stuff sinking in? I hope it is. And then the devaluation of life. James Watson, co-discoverer of DNA, said if, if a, a child with birth defects was not declared alive until three days after birth, the doctor could allow the child to die if the parents choose and save a lot of misery and suffering. How many of you know who Charles Darwin was? Come on. Okay. How many of you know who Adolf Hitler was? Unless you're from California, you don't. Raise your hand if you know who Margaret Sanger was. Okay, about five of you. Every Christian, every called out believer of God should know that Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Creator of the Negro Project, she called it. Her strategy, eliminating the black population. She believed in removing what she called the dead weight of human waste. We don't want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. So who was Charles Darwin and Margaret Sanger? They were evolutionists. What's evolution? Okay, changes, right? So Margaret Sanger and Charles Darwin influenced Adolf Hitler. Why did Adolf Hitler murder six million Jews and many millions of others? You go to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, been there twice, and the sign is still there. And it says he believed that the Jewish people were subhuman. They weren't fully human. That's evolution, right? They haven't fully evolved into human beings. And so I'm trying to share with you folks today the dangers of evolution, evolutionary teaching. It's everywhere, even in advertisement. Satan slips it in, slips it in. Programming, programming, programming. Margaret Sanger said the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infants is to kill it. But you know what, folks? I serve a God who's pro-life. Do you? Do you vote that way or do you vote the same way you've always voted? And I, I, want, to, I want to just say God is a God of forgiveness too. And when it comes to abortion... Isn't it awesome we serve a God is forgiving? But he also forgives you for the way you voted for years. And we need to change. 
God's word says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knows right well. So if a person doesn't think there's a God to be accountable to, says Jeffrey Dahmer, a murderer, he says, then what's the point? I always believe the theory of evolution as truth, that we all just came from slime, and when we're dead, that's it, there's nothing. So if your children are being taught, um, see, I, I used to work in the public school system. I don't know if I said that, but as a one-on-one, -on -one, and I watched, as I'm work, working with these youngsters, these young people, one-on-one, -on -one, I watched teachers offending the little ones, teaching evolution. And... By the way, the young people in here, you have to understand this. You're the best missionaries in the world. And you're going to the best mission field tomorrow morning called school. And you have such opportunities to influence your classmates and your teachers. But if they're learning that they're an animal, there's no God, do what you want, make up your own rules, and they're being bullied, a lot of us in here have been bullied. And it's, it carries a lifetime, let me tell you. But what can possibly enter their mind... Well, there's no God. I can make up my own rules. I'm being bullied. I hate being bullied. I'm going to kill my classmates. I'm going to kill myself. I don't have to give an account to a God because there isn't one. Do you know at Columbine, remember Columbine? Do you know Eric Harris wore a shirt that day that said natural selection? Who do you think he studied? Who was his hero? Charles Darwin. At some future period, Charles Darwin says, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. So as he predicted, who showed up? Hitler. Hitler said, I have the right to exterminate an inferior race that breeds like vermin. Let me control the textbooks and I'll control the state. So how many of us here believe that the textbooks have been changed and are continuing to be changed for years? To fit with what? Satan's plan of a one world government, a one world religion, a one world economy. We see it in the textbooks and we see it in this textbook. It matches again. So why are you here today? What can you do? Pastor's hope, my hope, your Sunday school teacher's hope, as we equip the saints is that you leave every Sunday with more tools to change your world. We can attend churches and hug and shake hands and love and fellowship and worship. And when we hear the word, we behold it in the mirror and then we forget. And we don't use the tools. You see, we're intentional about other things and... Everyone in here has a passion about something. Everybody has a passion about something, whether it's hunting or fishing or golfing or whatever. We all have a passion, and you talk about it all the time with those that you know. And, in, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But why, why are you here? There's many reasons. What can you do about this subject? of evolution that's tearing churches apart, tearing the world apart. Well, first of all, wake up. That's a good idea, isn't it, preacher? <laughs> On Sunday morning. <laughs> Don't fight over dumb stuff. Who cares what the color of carpet you're going to vote on is? And that tears churches apart. Dumb stuff. Be active. Plug yourself in. Be about your father's business. Don't compromise God's word. Understand how we can deal with evolution because it's crept in the church. Um, why are we seeing less of this stuff? Because we're dealing with the subject and the best thing we can do is evangelize. My, my theory is if we're winning the loss, we'd see a lot less of this, don't you? Here's the answer. Isaiah 58, 12. This is talking about repairing, repairing, repairing. Some of your families need to be repaired. Your relationships need to be repaired. And you're screaming to God for help. So how can we do that? One way, train up our children the way they should go. Well, we've done that, and they're gone. <laughs> They've left the faith. Well, we have hope, right? Where did the prodigal son's father, where was he at when the son came home? Looking, watching, 
in the driveway, ready to give a robe and a ring and more love. It's tough. Raise your hand if you're a Sunday school teacher, and I'm almost finished. Don't say amen on that one, but Sunday school teachers, what should you be teaching in your church? Science. What kind of science? The real science. Because your young people in here, all of you are getting the wrong science on television, museums, and all that. So great opportunity to teach real science in church. How can I teach geology? Well, that's the Grand Canyon. And when you have me come back, I want to talk about Grand Canyon. And because that's that's geology and what's contained within the Grand Canyon, paleontology, the fossils. Well, where's geology and paleontology in the Bible? A worldwide flood in Genesis. And talk about that real science in Sunday school. There's a connection there. How about anthropology? I can't. How can I teach anthropology in Sunday school? You need to teach. Everybody hold up a big fat zero in your hand. I want to see all the zeros out there. Okay. How many races are there in the world today? None. Look, there are no races in the world. That's an evolutionary term. Don't use it. You see, the media loves it because they need ratings. Racism? Ratings. There's a match right there. And the devil's behind it. Jesus didn't come back and say, I'm coming back when you see racism. No, he said, uh, culture, culture, against culture, religion, against religion. That's what he's talking about. And that's what we see today. You see, there are no races, but there's one human family. Everybody, please look up here, because some of you aren't. There's one human family. Can I get an amen? No races, one family. Well, look at all those races. No, that's not race. That's one color. Huh? One color. No, look at all those colors. No, that's one color. No races, one family and one color called brown. And everybody's been brown since Adam and... But if you have more melanin in your skin, it's a pigment, you know, you're darker brown. If you have less melanin in your skin, you are lighter brown. And you know what? That's what the Bible teaches, anthropology right there. We all go back to Adam and Eve. Does that make sense to you? That's Bible science, isn't it? As I begin to close for the third time, say amen after each one. God is creator. Amen. God's word is infallible. Amen. Bible has answers. Amen. No death before sin. Amen. No millions of years. Amen. Evolution is not true. Amen. You cannot say evolution is not true if you don't know why it's not true. That's why you need to be educated on this stuff. You can't say this is true if you don't know why it's true. Young people, especially when you have this foundation right here and solid and strong, when you go to school, you go to college, and your professors professing themselves to be wise. That, by the way, they need to be prayed for. Amen? All the teachers do. And respected. Please respect your teachers. But you, you can't make a difference if you don't know what to say. So you have to be educated here. Our children go to school tomorrow. You going to school tomorrow? You don't know if you're going to school tomorrow? Oh, yeah, it's break. I forgot. Wrong time of the year. Okay, when you go back to school, you're going to say to your classmates, because you're so excited, Jesus loves you, the Bible says so, and they say the Bible's not true. You know, how did dinosaurs fit in the Bible? Where did Cain get his wife? I don't know. I can't tell you because I'm not able. And then they say... That's the best one of the day, and that's all you know. And then they say, I told you the Bible's not true. And then your children come to you, parents, with the same questions. And if you say, I don't have the answers, then how can you train the best missionaries in the world? So be ready. We all have to be ready to give the best answer we can. We don't know all the answers, but we, we can do a much better job. Because they're asking why we have hope. And last but not least, and this is it, and you've got to understand this, okay? you got to understand this, but I say this every Sunday. All that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And I'm, I'm unashamedly going to tell you this. I've been to Guyana. We have some folks from Guyana here. A great country. And I go every year, and I want to connect you folks to my friend in Guyana because I want him 
the pastor to come here and preach to you. But that's y'all pray about that. But in Guyana, um, there's a lot of people that are Hindu, right? Hindu. And my pastor friend Peter, he's in the middle of this huge community of Hindu folks, and and you see yard after yard after yard after yard with temples, these little temples, Hindu temples in their yards. So I mean, kind of convenient. But We've been in the schools, the public schools, passing out hundreds of Gideon Bibles. And they take them. And I said, I'm from America, and I say, we have lots of gods too. And one of them is a pigskin. And I think God is a jealous God. And I think he's sick and tired of the gods that we put in front of him. Whether it's that thing with an apple on the back that has a bite out of it, that has a lot of knowledge of good and evil, and I can do it very easily, and you can too. And young people, I want you to understand this. There's a verse in the Bible that says, God is beholding the evil and the good. His eyes are in every place. And when you're on your phone, and mom and daddy doesn't know, other people know, and God knows. And you could say, mom and daddy, I love you. And you lie. And you lie. Because talk is cheap. You're a Christian young person, The proof's in the pudding. You prove it. But prove it to God most. Because he has a heart too. And his heart's breaking. When you lie and deceive. And that's for everybody. But I'm telling you what I hear. I'll be done in a second. I'll tell you what I hear every Sunday. Almost without fail. Even after I say my little spiel here. Is that from August to February. I hear it. Who's playing? Who's playing? Who's playing? Who's playing today? And I'll tell you how many Christians know every sport out there, every team member, and every statistic about those players, and they know squat about the Bible. So I want to encourage you on these things today that you've heard. You want revival? Start in your home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. God, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. We fail, we fail, we 